let me just welcome you wholeheartedly to uh, our presentation today. Five years ago, uh, Ralf Dommermuth, Klaus Hommels, René Obermann, myself and a few other persons decided to found the Internet Economy Foundation. Uh, the aim was and is to strengthen the European ecosystem in the digital era area. And uh, we believe that this is a very important thing that we have a European strong voice. And of course, what we do today uh, to present uh, a new study highlighting key design choices facing the European Central Bank, the questions of the digital euro are of extreme importance. Uh, to focus on European financial sovereignty. The digital euro is a great chance for us uh, to be innovative, to look forward, uh, and to strengthen the whole ecosystem. And it is a great pleasure for the IEF board, together with Chainlink, Lakestar, Economy, its partners, uh, to welcome you. And I would like to hand the floor to Clark Parsons, who is our executive director, whom you all do know, uh, and Clark, if you would be so kind to moderate this session. Super. Thanks so much, Professor Flueger, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good morning, depending on your time zone. We're really delighted to have you all with us. We're delighted, uh, as Professor Flueger said, to, um, to uh, have this discussion based on the study that we four partners just released a couple of weeks ago about uh, the digital euro. Um, fun fact, it's always wonderful when, um, when the economist is perfectly aligned with what you're doing. This is this week's economist cover story talking about uh, decentralized finance. Um, so it's clear that the editors at the economist are also seeing what's happening in the traditional financial world where, um, where the, the tidal wave of uh, decentralized finance is uh, starting to be taken very seriously. A couple of housekeeping notes before we jump in quickly. Um, as I mentioned to those of you who might have already heard it, this uh, event is under Chatham House rules. I think we do have some members of the press with us. Uh, that means that um, anything that's discussed here uh, could be potentially paraphrased, but um, uh, in no way attributed to one of the speakers. If any of you later would like to potentially get quotes from a speaker, uh, we would be happy to connect you so that you can get direct quotes if you like. But uh, what we say here uh, should be a safe space for everyone to speak freely. Also, the Zoom call uh, that we're doing here is being recorded right now. Um, we will edit it and post it on the web later. Just be aware of that if you don't want your image uh, on the video potentially, then please, um, uh, then please take your video uh, screen sharing off. And a final note, we do have allotted about a half an hour on the back end uh, after, after about the one hour mark uh, for potential questions and discussion. I have a lot of questions uh, potentially to follow up with the speakers anyway, um, but for those of you who might want to pose a question, please do so privately to me in the Zoom chat. We have an easy chat function here in Zoom at the bottom. Uh, just direct your message to me so that uh, the rest of us don't at all get distracted. I'll uh, correspond with you, sift your questions, et cetera, uh, and hopefully be able to get um, get some of them asked um, for you. Uh, and I think that was uh, the only thing I had links. Also, afterwards, we'll be sending some links around. Um, and uh, so let's kick things off. First, we'd like to hear from uh, the partners uh, who've uh, put this study together. Uh, and then we have three wonderful speakers from, uh, from the world of academia. And uh, of course, we're really delighted to have a really broad range of voices here. Um, and to kick things off, I'd like to um, invite uh, Valeria Aragones, um, who's a consultant in the crypto and digital money space at Economy, and uh, one of the key authors of our study, uh, to uh, kick us off and uh, set the frame for uh, why this study is here and, and what the basic ideas behind it are. So Valeria, thanks so much, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Clark. I will share my screen now. Okay, perfect. So uh, welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Clark already presented me, but um, in any case, I'm Valeria Aragones Diaz. I'm consultant at Economy for Crypto Economy and um, Digital uh, Money. Economy is a Berlin-based beauty consultancy 
that is committed to uh, facilitate the development of the European startup and scale up ecosystem. And we have been very engaged uh, on fintech and DeFi um, development in the mainly in the uh, building space. So we're quite close to how programmable money is key in the development of the future of in infrastructure and the global tech scene. So I would like to study just uh, giving to, to start just giving a high level of uh, the study. Um, so basically we wanted to, um, with the partners wanted to present the study on establishing the digital euro and how to ensure financial sovereignty on the digital realm. Uh, and we started with an introduction on, C on the topic of CBDC and how is uh, going on with what is going on with the research uh, around the world. And on the second section, we talk about digital central bank currencies and their role in the innovation economy. But we also didn't want to uh, leave it on the just the pure economic uh, analysis on the impact of the central bank digital currency, but also to move on the geopolitics, because we also saw that it's a topic that is quite neglected in, in most of the study and, and not talking uh, so much about academia, but, but in general terms that um, the role of currencies uh, in geopolitics is not so much taken into account in, in most of the material we analyze. And from there, we um, go to propose uh, to the central European Central Bank uh, some uh, policy recommendations and uh, where it should be um, going for the design and the project for the digital euro. So um, we see of key we see in the key potential of the digital euro mainly to um, a strength your position within the boom and digitalization of global finance and that, uh, depending of the design uh, that is um, applied um, on the project of the digital euro to secure the position of the euro as a global reserve currency to stay competitive to private money, as we see uh, many incumbents in, in, um, in the realm, digital realm today, and also to be compatible with innovation and data machine economy, because today, uh, um, money is not only used in the exchange of value between humans, but also in the automation of payment between machines. So um, we like to um, resume this, um, to summarize the, the policy recommendations in very uh, short but straight uh, points uh, for the ECB and all that are uh, involved in the design of the digital euro to ensure financial sovereignty in the digital realm. So starting creating digital euro with a focus on European financial sovereignty, use the digital euro to reinforce the position of the euro as an international reserve currency, design the digital euro with a wider vision of uh, for a more secure future financial system, the design, of course, should follow the function and keep innovation at heart, and that will lead us to tailor the digital euros to fit the needs and realities of the European startup and scale up and DeFi ecosystem. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the discussions that are coming. Super. Thanks so much, Valeria. We're, um, uh, for those of you, of course, who have not yet seen the study, it's, it, it was linked in a lot of our um, invitations, but of course, uh, we, when we uh, follow up, we'll also send you a link to make sure you can download it. You can find it actually on the um, IEF website uh, anytime. Um, next up, we would love to hear uh, from Nicholas Brand from Lakestar. Uh, as Valeria just mentioned, you know, one of the key elements for us at the IEF uh, is to um, have the perspective of uh, the startup, scale-up, and innovation ecosystem of Europe at heart. Um, and many might be surprised to find that one of Europe's leading venture capital funds, who have been mainly supporting, um, if you will, traditional startups, uh, but also active in the fintech space um, and payment providers like Adyen, um, it might be surprising to many to find that Lakestar is also quite interested and active uh, in the decentralized finance uh, and blockchain ecosystem. So, uh, 
uh, Nicholas, we're really delighted to uh, hand you the microphone as, as one of our study partners here and also just hear um, yeah, why is Lakestar interested in, in this issue? What, ha what is it that uh, a traditional venture capitalist has now found so interesting um, from this new ecosystem? Of course, with pleasure. Thank you for enduring me today. And hello to all those little boxes on my screen. I think I'm the partner internally at the firm that runs our fintech and crypto investing. And we've had the privilege of accompanying a few success cases in the last decade, many of which even have kept regulators and central bankers at the edge of their seat. So we tend to be on the more progressive side of the innovation and things like Revolut or blockchain.com or CEDO.org, in fact, were our projects we've been involved with and, and had the privilege of learning and observing. And I think one thing that unites us internally at Lakestar is the fact that we're, we're proud Europeans. Most of us have a European passport and when I look at the financial system that make up Europe, I sit here today talking to you and I'm both tremendously excited and incredibly highly alerted. I'm tremendously excited because of course, we're in this intense period of friction where many, many forces are pulling on what people understand to be money. There's the regulator, regulators, the govern, government's perspective, there's the technocrats, the protocols are all claiming to have monetary solutions. And so when the, in, in this very, very intense period of friction, which provides for incredible nourishing ground for us as a venture capital investor. But I think at the same time, I'm also highly, highly alerted because money is no longer local. Money is a global phenomenon and frankly, we're in the middle of Cold War II. And FinTech is one of the key battlegrounds. The sovereignty over money is one of the key battlegrounds. And so if we are not an, on the best of our thinking, I think other private sectors, protocol approaches will outcompete us on the back of functional design on what constitutes money. And so I think that was one of the key reasons for us to also participate and support Prof Professor Flüger and Clark and the entire team as part of this study, because at the end, we're no infinite source of wisdom ourselves. It's the combination of all our brains, the combination of all our thinking that we need to really put together our, our, our uh, we need to put our thinking hats on and really figure out how are we going to design something like digital euro? Because if we do it right, it can powerfully shape the very makeup of the financial system that constitutes Europe for decades to come. And so clearly we're the practitioners, the technocratic perspective, and it's been an absolute privilege, Clark, to work with you and your team. And so look forward to the conversation in the next few minutes. Super, thanks so much, Nico. It's uh, great to have you with us. Um, and, uh, and great that you, uh, you know, mentioned, of course, um, uh, the entire decentralized finance world and, and the blockchain world. Um, our, our next speaker and, and a partner on our study for us is also um, proven to just really be a key player uh, in this whole constellation, um, Sergei Nazarov, because um, up until now, I think many people would feel like we have parallel worlds that have been going and growing. You know, we have our traditional financial model and, and you know, the post-World War II architecture of how money works so far with central banks. Um, and then the decentralized finance, blockchain, DLT world that has sort of grown up, if you will, as kind of a renegade or outsider movement obviously they're coming together now. And that's why it's so great to have Sergey with us because what he represents um, is a technology that is literally bridging the worlds. And that's, uh, I think that both sides have a lot to learn from what Chainlink uh, has been doing and learning for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it. Um, it's a secure middleware. It enables institutions to interact with any blockchain or distributed ledger technology. Uh, many would, would call it an Oracle solution. Uh, but they really specialize in, if you will, tying a lot of the new world of on-chain blockchain solutions into, let's say, the established uh, world. So, so they really are technically bridging the worlds. And, and so, Sergey, it's great to have you with us. And, and we're really delighted uh, that you and your team uh, were partners with us on the study. Um, so I'm really curious, just in general, you know, we have this parallel world that's been going uh, so far. What would be the benefit? Of, you know, how can CBDCs and central bank currencies, um, how can that be a benefit to the entire uh, decentralized finance and blockchain world? I mean, why do you, why do we need CBDCs, if you will? Um, because you're you're someone who's bridged the worlds, but maybe the, the first world didn't necessarily need uh, the euro or the dollar or the pound or the yuan 
to go digital. What's the benefit of that? Sure, sure. So, and thank you, thank you for having me. Great, great to be here. Um, the 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 belief that I have is that the sooner everything is controlled by a smart contract, the better off everyone is. And everyone is both society and people who control and regulate the systems of society, individual members of society, and also the commercial world. And the, the reason for that is because, um, you know, since the beginning of cl the client server model and the internet, internet's later appearance, we have been kind of in this stage, uh, state of digital transformation. So over multiple decades, we've been going to a different uh, set of digital transformation steps. And what, what smart contracts and blockchains are, are they are the end state of digital transformation. And the reason they are the end state is because they are the most reliable form of digital transformation. So the initial forms of digital transformation took things like the telex machine or what were called telegraph agreements or these, these types of agreements that were digital but didn't have certain properties about transferability, proof, reliability, accessibility, and 50 other qualities that internet-based agreements had, right? And then you had internet-based agreements and they were like, things like e-signature and Uber is an internet-based agreement and Airbnb is an Airbnb internet-based agreement and amazon.com is an internet-based agreement. But the, the thing that all these systems lack is they lack um, a component of reliability. And they, they overcome this by creating um, fraud mitigation strategies like delays or very, so they basically just eat the cost of fraud. And sometimes the fraud isn't a solvable problem. And so you have things like Wirecard or it's not outright fraud and just the expectations of users are very, very um, dislocated from reality like Robinhood. But what, what smart contracts do is they align um, expectations of users and society with what digital systems actually are going to do because they don't allow any deviation. Uh, smart contracts aren't based on a person deciding the solvency of their enterprise. They're based on mathematics and physics enforcing things like solvency, enforcing things like collateral. And so when you look at um, the nature of contracts, their reliability is one of their primary properties. And so the, the agreements and the systems that create a reliable system of contracts are actually the systems that win and they're the systems where everybody, want, everybody wants to conduct commerce. So that's, I think, one of the reasons you actually such a, see such a difference between emerging markets and develop, more developed markets in that in developed markets, you have a system of contract that contracts that works and people can conduct commerce and people are comfortable purchasing from those markets and making contractual relationships within those markets and you know between th their market and an external one. And I think what's, what's, what's going to happen is that that playing field of reliable agreement is gonna be leveled by smart contracts, both on a domestic level and an international level. And the reason that CBDCs play into this very strongly is because they control trillions of dollars in value. And that trillions of dollars in value wants to interact with um, other useful systems. So, so my goal in, in, in the body of work we have at Chainlink and even, even part, being part of the IEF and even, even the work and discussion we're having here is the acceleration of smart contracts as a way for people to utilize various um, financial products in DeFi, use CBDCs and have CBDCs interact with DeFi products because once again, it's it's just a better system of financial agreement, which means that every dollar of value that flows in from retail or institutional CBDC holdings or what whatever set of holdings, that value is better off. The people that are on the other side of the transaction are better off. And very interestingly enough, even people making policies and deciding how the world works, they're better off because these systems force transparency which is the fundamental problem that, that people in society have with the financial markets is that there are people who have information asymmetries that allow them to profit massively while society foots the bill on their counterparty losing all their money, right? That's like the fundamental problem of, of modern financial markets is that one group profits massively and then society uh, pays the bill for the group that lost their money 
to that very, very small, very profitable group. And so with transparency, those big boom and busts probably won't be as common because everybody could analyze the same information, which, which they still can't in today's financial markets. So there are, are a number of different, uh, different directions to approach the benefits here. It's kind of mind boggling how many there are, but at a high level, um, I think that's, that's a high level overview. Super. Thanks so much, Sergey. And actually, it's funny you mentioned boom and bust. One of the papers, um, one of the authors of, 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 uh, that we'll hear from in a moment, uh, one of the points that, um, uh, that was brought, actually, I think it was uh, Michael Kumhoff, um, was uh, the potential, actually, of CBDCs to help steer the boom and bust cycle by, by creating another tool, if you will, uh, for the central bankers. So thanks so much, Sergey. It's really Great to hear from you, and 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 I will. I would like to come back to you as well. You mentioned this notion um, uh, about uh, you know those who have access, let's say, if you will, in the uh, in, in the West to you know, reliable financial systems. You know, a lot of the promise of of uh, decentralized finance is actually to help uh, the unbanked or the people from our unreliable systems. I mean, I think it's no accident that a country like El Salvador would try to experiment with going to Bitcoin. Um, because um, because of you know currency swings and other things, so a lot of topics to open up. Um, now we'd love to jump in and and go longer, if you will, with some of the invited experts we've brought. Um, I'd love to go, if you will, back to the source. Um, Michael Kumhoff is um, a senior research advisor at the Bank of England Research Hub, and um, way back in 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 ye old 2016, he actually wrote a staff working paper about the macroeconomics of central bank digital currencies. Um, and I know that Valeria and our team uh, and our partners at Iconomy really um, uh, relied on this uh, paper. It's really one of the most influential papers that's been published in recent years. So it's really a, a, an honor and a delight for us to have Michael Kumhoff with us um, because uh, he's been one of the um, most well-known thinkers on this subject for quite some time. And uh, his work is cited by many and uh, and has really formed a good basis for um, for this issue. Uh, Michael has got a presentation for us and I'll hand the mic over to you. And for those of you who aren't academics, uh, don't be worried. I think in the middle, it'll get a bit crunchy on the academic side. But um, when I looked at the slides, I already learned a lot. And I think on the back end, it'll really inform a lot of our discussion. So we're gonna dive a bit into theory. It's gonna get a bit academic, but I think it's gonna um, serve us all well to understand the context of the macroeconomics here. So uh, with that, we're really delighted, uh, Michael Kumhoff, to uh, hand the microphone over to you uh, and let you lead us through uh, your presentation. Uh, thank you very much for, for the kind introduction. And I am delighted too. And I always really benefit from interacting with uh, uh, market participants and, and practitioners, because ultimately that should inform um, anything that uh, we do in the monetary theory, essentially. Uh, but I think on, the, on this occasion, as you said, uh, theory led uh, practice a little bit. We, were, we actually coined the term CBDC in 2016, uh, but at that time, um, and still today, what we had to do is we, we basically had to think about the world that we don't have data for, we don't have practical experience with, and we had to set up a lab, so to speak, uh, using a model uh, that is familiar to central bankers, but modified to accommodate the existence uh, of CBDC. So that's what we did in 2016. Uh, and it's been really fascinating to see how fast uh, this uh, has, has progressed uh, in, in the five years since. So it's, it's joint work with John Bardier, who is uh, still a, an esteemed colleague uh, of mine uh, at the Bank of England. And of, of course, the usual uh, disclaimer applies. Um, and so very brief introduction, what is a CBDC for the purpose of this paper? And I think that's uh, also how most central banks think about it right now. Uh, it represents access to the central bank's balance sheet. It was earlier called a liability of the central bank. I would take issue with that characterization because central bank money is best not characterized as a debt or a liability, but rather as some form of hybrid equity, which is a point I've tried to make with some legal co-authors in a working paper published earlier this year. Uh, we think of universal access, banks, firms, and households, electronic access, 
probably using DLT, although uh, the con there's no consensus that that is a necessary part of it uh, anymore. Initially, when we published the paper, it was. Uh, national currency denominated, so in our case, it would be a one-to-one -one exchange rate with pound sterling. It would be a pound sterling um, issued only through spending uh, or against eligible assets. Eligible assets are for the very most part government bonds, and that's how we're going to treat it in the paper. This is an important point. Uh, it's much deeper than what it appears, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, interest bearing uh, to equate demand and supply at a one-to-one -one exchange rate. Uh, when you issue money and you over-issue it, then some price has to equate demand and supply. And if that's not the interest rate, it would have to be the general price level. And that would be a recipe for uh, inflation instability. Hence, we advocate uh, an interest bearing CVDC. That interest rate then, or alternatively, the quantity of CVDC can be used as a second tool of countercyclical monetary policy. And finally, very importantly, we see this as coexisting with the existing banking system, which would continue to operate as it does today in that part of its business that you know takes deposits and make loans. Um, of course, uh, the, the, the banking system would have to then compete with CBDC, uh, might want to offer some of the front uh, end services for CBDC, et cetera, et cetera. But it operates alongside, uh, unlike what I've written about in other papers, where if you had a, a full scale, full reserve banking system, that would no longer be the case. Um, now, uh, we build a model, as I said, we needed a lab in order to think about what are the issues. Uh, and so I, I used uh, my work with Jeremy Benish at the, uh, at the IMF. Uh, we published a working paper on the Chicago plan. That would be universal narrow banking, which goes much further than CBDC. You can think of CBDC as the little cousin of uh, universal narrow banking or the Chicago plan. Uh, and the other work uh, we joined with Zoltan Jakob also at the IMF on uh, what banks do and that banks are not intermediaries of funds, but creators of funds. Uh, the non-monetary model elements are otherwise standards. We have households. I'm only giving you a very high level view here um, that, uh, create, uh, that, that uh, use deposits created by banks through loans. Uh, central bank digital currency created by the central bank through asset purchases and deposits and CBDC jointly serving as the medium of exchange, i.e. the thing that people use in order to buy their groceries and their cars. Uh, banks, the, their role is to create new deposits by making new loans. The government conducts fiscal policy as it does now, but it needs to be modified. It uh, conducts traditional monetary policy using the policy rate as it does today. Uh, but it would also conduct CBDC monetary policy, which is separate. Now, uh, in the presentation that we've just seen by the ECB, I was very heartened to see um, that, the, uh, that Dr. Schaaf made a distinction between reserves and CBDC and that there would be basically separate forms of central bank money. Again, that is not a trivial distinction. That is a very deep point because some people have advocated merging CBDC and reserves uh, and configuring CBDC as universal access to central bank money. Uh, in our view, that would be uh, very, very dangerous. And, and in our view, we have, we have therefore advocated not doing that and indeed doing the same thing as the ECB uh, presenter advocated, namely having it as a third form of central bank money. Um, and and we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, now, in the model, I had, now it gets a little technical, I'll rush. Um, uh, banks uh, have what is known in the jargon as a, cost, a costly state verification technology where they, they uh, need to verify what their borrowers are up to. They need to pre-commit their lending rates and expose that it might turn out that they have made losses on their loans or also gains on their loans. They might have lent too much or too little. Um, in order to compensate ex ante for this risk, there is a spread uh, on the interest rate on the asset side of banks' balance sheet. On the liability side, uh, we use what is known in the jargon as a transactions cost technology. 
where basically uh, if, if more liquidity leads to a lower cost of consumption, the question is what is liquidity? And in our model, that is basically an amalgam of bank deposits and CBDC that I will talk about more. Uh, we don't even think about cash here because cash is in many economies, uh, a, a very small component of the overall payments landscape in terms of transactions uh, volume, not transactions number perhaps, but transaction volume. So we abstract from it altogether. Furthermore, cash is likely to have a different use case from electronic, electronic payments media. So we think about the, the competition between bank deposits and CBDC. Now, this amalgam that I talked about uh, is what we call the liquidity generating function, um, where basically what this tells you in mathematical form is that you need a combination of bank deposits and CBDC to satisfy your liquidity needs. And that can take different functional forms, uh, but it basically means uh, there is a parameter in there that tells you how substitutable are the two in practice. How easily can I use CBDC instead of deposits and vice versa? Um, now, if you want to make quantitative predictions about what CBDC is going to do, that is a parameter, the magnitude of which you really need to know. Uh, and that's, of course, something that we know very little about, except to say uh, there is research on the substitutability between different bank deposits at different institutions, which seems to indicate that the substitutability is very low because deposits are very sticky. They don't move in response to even su substantial interest differences at the retail level. Uh, and that may be an important insight for the future. Uh, and if you work with that assumption, it affects your quantitative uh, conclusions. Then we need to talk briefly about fiscal policy. I have here in, in, in uh, mathematical form what is known as a government budget constraint, where BG is uh, government debt, R times BG is interest rate on government debt, and then G, transfer, and tau, that's basically spending, transfer payments by the government, and tax revenue. That's a standard uh, in, in the jargon, a government budget constraint. And what I would like to point out here is that CBDC enters very much like government debt, uh, but with a very important difference that the interest rate RM on CBDC is going to be much lower than the interest rate R on government debt, because CBDC is a payments medium and a payments medium is held not just because it pays an interest rate, but also because it offers convenience, which is why prior to the low interest period that we're living in today, uh, bank deposits on average typically had a one to two percentage point discount to the policy rate uh, because people don't just hold bank deposits for the interest rate uh, thereon. Uh, and that's, of course, fiscally important. This point is fiscally important. Then uh, for fiscal policy, in order to formulate a rule, you need, uh, you need to take into account that CVDC is there and you don't want it to destabilize your fiscal policy. And we found that the way to do that is to define a deficit ratio, which a lot of countries use these days in order to steer their, pol uh, their policy. The ratio of deficit to GDP shouldn't um, uh, uh, move around too much. Um, and basically, uh, the deficit is the, the difference between today's debt and yesterday's debt. And we argue that you have to add CBDC to debt uh, in order to make uh, fiscal policy stable. More details are in the paper. Monetary policy. Now, this is the interest rate on reserves. Again, Jürgen Schaaf uh, advocated earlier that reserves and CBDC should be different forms of central bank money. At least that's what it looked like from the slides. This will be the interest rate on reserves, not on CBDC. Uh, and I is the policy rate. And the last term on the right-hand side is the forward-looking inflation rate. And this is how, in a stylized form, central banks are described to be doing policy today. They respond to inflation when inflation gets too high or above their target. They raise the policy rate. Uh, and that's a standard rule. Uh, and we're basically saying, yes, uh, this. This would remain, uh, but you need to you need to really have central bank uh, uh, reserves and CBDC being separate form of central bank money uh, in order for that rule to have the same meaning as it does today. If you merge the two, it would have a completely different meaning. Now, for CBDC, you then have the choice to either target its quantity or its price. 
meaning the interest rate. And that was, of course, a prominent debate under monetarism in the 70s and 80s, what should we target? And it was concluded that it should be the interest rate. I will talk about that in a minute, um, but here are the options. Uh, you can fix the quantity of CBDC, in this case, relative to GB, uh, GDP, and then the interest rate on CBDC has to clear the market so that demand is equal to supply. And you could also have a countercyclical response to inflation, uh, whereby you would remove CBDC from circulation in a boom, because in a boom, people have too much money lying around that they want to spend. If you remove some of that money, you might dampen the boom, which is, which is a countercyclical policy. Alternatively, you could target the interest rate uh, and basically have it at a certain discount under the policy rate, the interest rate on reserves. In that case, the quantity would clear the market and basically at that interest rate, uh, banks could come to the central bank and demand more CBDC, uh, but the assets against which they can demand it is a key uh, question. And we'll come to that later in the context of financial stability. So we now uh, talk about some policy experiments. And the first is a transition from a world without CBDC altogether without to a world with CBDC, and the magnitude is 30% of GDP worth of CBDC overnight, just for the sake of making it uh, very crisp and clean so that you can see what's going on. And uh, I have summarized down there the main effects uh, of such a policy in our simulated model, which is subject to a lot of calibration of individual parameters, but we spend uh, months trying to get that calibration right. So. If somebody wants to challenge us on that, they would do the same kind of, would have to do the same kind of homework. And basically we find that in roughly equal measure, these output gains are due to uh, real interest rate effects, uh, fiscal beneficial effects due to the ability to lower taxes, which is connected to the lower interest rates because when you have to pay lower interest rates on your debt, then you can uh, uh, plow that back into lowering tax rates. And if those tax rates uh, prevent capital accumulation and labor effort, then that benefits your economy even more. And finally, reductions in liquidity tax rates, which is uh, our, our expression for basically um, the cost or the reduction in cost of liquidity in the economy. In the initial economy, liquidity is only produced by banks, which has certain costs attached to it uh, because they have to satisfy their shares or shareholders, the regulators, there's market power, what, what have you. Um, if you issue some liquidity and it's only a certain share and not a very large share in this experiment, then you can nevertheless produce overall liquidity a little more cheaply. Uh, and that also gives you some output gains. Okay, so this is, is, is a simulation which shows 60 quarters along the horizontal axis, i.e. 15 years, uh, shows you that if you introduce CBDC, the beneficial effects, some of them will be immediate, some of them will take time because they work via capital accumulation. Capital accumulation takes time. You see that uh, real interest rates drop in the long run, fiscal tax rates drop in the long run, what we call liquidity tax rates drop in the long run, um, and GDP increases by 1.5% in the short run and 3% in the long run. Uh, mostly, but not only due to an increase in investment. If you look on the top right, you see bank deposits. There's a short blip at the beginning, but they also grow in the end. And this is because there's a synergy. Uh, first of all, there's a synergy between bank deposits and CBDC. Uh, if you benefit one to some extent, you will benefit the other. Uh, and furthermore, the overall output gains in the economy uh, mean that there is uh, a greater demand for all financial services. This meaning, therefore, that there is, uh, according to this simulation, no threat to the banking system from the presence uh, of CBDC in terms of its balance sheet size. Uh, we talked um, now about the quantity rules or price rules, interest rate or the quantity of CBDC, what should we target? Uh, there was a long debate about that on the monetarism, as I said, uh, and uh, Poole wrote an important paper on that question where he said that if money demand shocks are very important uh, and you target the quantity of money, you really destabilize the real economy. Uh, and so this simulation, which only goes over 32 quarters or eight years, 
uh, tries to explore that where the blue line is a quantity rule where I fix only the quantity of CBDC and the dashed red line is an interest rate rule on CBDC. And what you observe is in the top left, you have GDP uh, and the shock is a money demand. Shock is a shock to liquidity demand. People want more liquidity for every given level of real activity. What that means is that, first of all, there is less real activity. Uh, and secondly, people are sitting on their money, so to speak. Uh, and you can see there that under a quantity rule for CBDC, the output contraction is indeed a little bit deeper, but it's not that much. Uh, the reason for that, you can see on the second row, you have bank deposits and bank loans relative to GDP. The shock means that people demand more liquidity when banks create the marginal pound sterling or, or euro in the ECB's case, they can create that liquidity almost overnight. And of course, in fact, it's not overnight because you know there are transactions crossing this, but they can respond to it very, very quickly uh, if they think that this is a healthy increase in demand uh, and backed by sufficient collateral, etc. That means whether CBDC accommodates this uh, increase in demand matters at the margin, but it's not all important because the banks are the creator of the marginal unit of currency. That's the message from this. Finally, some counter cyclical rules. Uh, so this is basically simulating uh, GDP and inflation at the top there, boom bust cycle. The underlying shock is that banks lend more, liquidity is more ample from the banking side of things. GDP increases, inflation increases. Then policy rate is in the bottom left. Uh, with a standard Taylor rule for monetary policy, when inflation goes up, you would raise the policy rate to dampen the inflationary impact. And then when the economy crashes, you would lower it uh, to dampen the, the crash. That's a standard response. Now the dashed black line would, uh, would show you what happens if the CBDC rate remains at a fixed margin under the policy rate. Uh, and the dash red line shows you what we find is better than that. Namely, in a boom, you lower the rate on CBDC relative to the policy rate. Not in absolute term, the, the, the rate still goes up, but you lower it relative to the policy rate. Why? Because you have a boom, you want to make it less attractive to hold CBDC because when people have less spending money lying around, they're less likely to spend. And therefore that dampens the boom a little bit at the margin. And you see that on the bottom right, CBDC over GDP, when you do this, goes down uh, during the boom and goes up during the upturn, uh, thereby helping to dampen the cycle. And this is what happens to GDP under increasing counter cyclicality of CBDC interest rate rules. So basically the black line would be the baseline where you don't respond uh, to the state of the business cycle and you do keep a fixed margin and then the blue and the red is as you increasingly respond to uh, the boom bust. And you see that this over and above what the policy rate does helps to dampen the business cycle a little bit. Uh, quantitatively, of course, this may, remains to be much more explored, but you know, it's gonna be difficult with data because, uh, because we haven't lived in this world yet uh, and, and we, will, we will learn as we go, um, but we have to make some educated guesses. Finally, financial stability. This is a, a very important point. People have pointed out uh, 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 that, oh, there might be a bank runs. Our proposal in this paper in 2016, and also in a later paper I wrote with Claire Noon, who is now at the Reserve Bank of Australia, our proposal was that the central bank issues CBDC against eligible securities, and it guarantees to always issue CBDC against eligible securities. And that's what it does with cash and reserves today. That's how central bank money is issued. And we argue, secondly, the central bank should never guarantee to issue CBDC against bank deposits. It can issue CBDC against bank deposits 99.9% .9 of the time, but when push comes to shove, there is no guarantee. Because what, what does it mean? Uh, well, it means that if, if you were to guarantee it, then I could always come to the Bank of England with my checkbook drawn on my bank account and say, uh, give me CBDC in return. What does the central bank get? It gets a bank deposit. The central bank becomes then a lender to the banking system. And ultimately, if, they, if there is an unconditional guarantee, it could become an, an unlimited lender uh, to the banking system uh, of last resort. It would open the door to an aggregate bank run. Um, 
And uh, some recent papers in the academic literature have some have, have sort of downplayed that risk and sort of made it, <coughs> excuse me, look as though uh, that might not be such a big deal. Um, I, I, if, if you were to open the uh, Financial Times the next morning uh, and look at the headlines, it would be a big deal. It would be a, a perceived to be a catastrophe. So uh, what we then uh, conclude, if you were to adopt our scheme, uh, is that bank deposits to CBDC run, runs become very hard in aggregate. Why is that? Uh, an aggregate run to CBDC is not a run from deposits, but from eligible assets. Uh, Non-banks can only buy CBDC against bank deposits from other non-banks. Uh, one of your participants and I could trade CBDC against bank deposits, but that doesn't change the aggregate quantity of bank deposit and doesn't put the banks into any kind of trouble. It is only when the central bank has its door open and say, you can get rid of your bank deposits to me, uh, that then there is uh, a, pot a potential of a run from deposits in aggregate. If you can only bring eligible assets to the central bank, that is not true. Uh, furthermore, central bank policy rules can discourage volatile CBDC demand. Under a quantity rule, you could say, I'm fixing the CBDC supply, let the interest rate clear the market. Um, when a lot of people want to want CBDC, want to get rid of bank deposits, and there is a high demand for CBDC, uh, but only a fixed supply, then this might drive the interest rate into negative territory, uh, which might be acceptable, but only up to a point, at which point the central bank might say no further than this, let it, let's say an interest rate of minus 3% for the sake of argument. And they would say uh, the supply is now endogenous, the quantity clears the market, you can come and if you're willing to suffer a 3% nominal loss, you can get more CBDC then you could only have a, a run or a, or a problem if, this, uh, if the market were to run out of eligible assets. And even then the central bank could decide uh, to switch to other securities and accept them temporarily as eligible assets. Beyond that, and then we're talking uh, serious panic territory, only beyond that would, uh, would you actually have a, a problem with maintaining this regime. Um, and as we argued in the paper with Claire Noon, um, you know, you can never altogether avoid a risk of this kind, but you can make it happen much later, much less likely, uh, and you have thereby put an important uh, fail safe into the system that uh, is a much better guarantee for the stability of the banking system. So here's my summary. We have uh, looked at the, uh, what we call steady state efficiency, i.e. what would output do if you introduce CBDC? Uh, from nothing, um, we found due to lower real interest rates, higher seniorage, that being revenue from money uh, creation, and more and cheaper liquidity, you could get an increase in steady state GDP, could be as much as 3%, for 30% of GDP worth of GD uh, CBDC. Business cycle stability, you would gain access to a second policy instrument, improved ability to stabilize inflation and the business cycle, financial stability, there's many, many more aspects to financial stability that I haven't been able to talk about. They're, they're in the original paper. Um, if CBDC, uh, CBDC, CBDC system were to be designed badly, it could introduce some financial stability risks, such as the ones that we were talking about. But a sound system design can avoid that. Um, we have uh, uh, made clear why we think the account limits that have elsewhere been mentioned as an alternative fail safe are uh, a less uh, a good measure. Uh, but you know, that's an ongoing debate. Uh, our, our solution was to only uh, have CBDC issued against eligible assets. The critical issue, uh, and I believe in this uh, uh, conference, we're gonna get to that, is the design of a smooth transition, i.e. Uh, you want to get the hardware, software, legal, regulatory issues right so that don't, you don't end up with egg on your face on the first morning of CBDC going live. Uh, that's obvious, and that's why many central banks have been doing such a lot of homework on this question. But I think it's fair to say that if they didn't think that there were macroeconomic gains from it, uh, they wouldn't have started to do this in the first place. And I think our paper sort of concludes that, yes, there are potential 
uh, large macroeconomic gains. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Super. Thank, thanks so much, uh, uh, Michael Kumhoff. That was, uh, uh, like I, I had warned everybody, uh, really a great deep dive into the theory. But in the end, you come out with some really fascinating conclusions that I think anyone can understand. Um, the thing I always take away from it when I look at your charts is that um, the, the people in the in the engine room of a central bank have crunched the numbers and said, actually, this entire idea is beneficial to us. I think many people have often thought, maybe even politicians, uh, that central bank digital currencies are just there to try and uh, keep up with the Joneses, if you will. But the fact that you've run all these numbers and theoretically concluded uh, there are actually a lot of really fantastic benefits here. We get a new set of tool. We get a new toolbox to uh, to fight boom and bust cycles. We get a bump in our GDP. Um, you know, we take some friction out of our economy. I mean, I think there's a lot of really fantastic and heartening conclusions to see here. Um, so thanks so much, uh, A, for the presentation, but also just for the for the ongoing work you've been doing. Uh, we do have some time, uh, at least 15 minutes, to to get through some questions and actually. Uh, many of you have, have jumped in with some questions. Um, I see, and in fact, it's great to see, I think uh, Jürgen Schaff is back. I, I know you lost your connection briefly. So um, I have a few questions that, that have been posed to, um, to uh, Michael Kumhoff, to Jürgen Schaff. I'd throw one maybe to Sergei, um, uh, if I could, Sergei Nazarov from Chainlink first, because um, uh, I think it was a really fabulous point at the end of Michael Kumhoff's presentation. You know, we have to get a smooth transition right I think many people look at uh, a lot of the crypto busts or things that have been happening uh, in the blockchain world just in the last year in DeFi uh, and see a lot of booming and busting going on. Um, and, and I think um, anything that uh, a chain link can do to you know, be the mitigating factor in bridging these worlds, I think can be really helpful. So I'm curious to know, you know how, can, um, how can CBDCs be, be transacted across different ledgers? I mean, you're you're bringing all of these different blockchain ledgers um, together uh, with, um, with you know, the old economy or the existing infrastructure. I'm just curious, you know, if we sort of start to talk tech here uh, a little bit, um, a quick question, how can, how can all of these pieces work together? Um, you know, if, if a Bank of England comes out with a CBDC and a Euro uh, CBDC is there and a digital dollar, how are they going to work together? Yeah, sure, glad to explain. I actually have a, Quick question for Professor Kumhoff, if he's if he's there. Hi, hi, Professor uh, Kumhoff. That was a fantastic uh, presentation, and Far I think away. I've briefly briefly seen your um, your papers, but I haven't dived deeply enough into them. I'm definitely going to do that after after this talk. Um, I I think what you're basically saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're creating a parallel system that serves as almost a backup, with a different set of rules and a different set of risks. Is that is that about right? From from the same regulatory body, is that right? Uh, yeah, although I wouldn't have put it as that serves as a backup, um, uh, because you know I, I would envisage that if, if central banks do their job, uh, the the banking system is not going to need a backup uh, as such, right? Yeah. Not in terms of it going down and CBDC then uh, 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 doing all payments, but otherwise, yes, I agree. Got it. Makes makes sense. In, in that regard, you know, in the scarier versions of the world that, uh, you know, the people with the tinfoil hats are particularly worried about in in an in a inflationary environment where inflation really does go a little bit bananas. And. Um, and this actually works the way, you know, the way it was proposed here, right, where you could have a counter cyclical dynamic or you can go counter to what the reserve, uh, the normal reserves are doing. Do you think that infl like the, the degree to which inflation increases, could that serve to accelerate the degree to which CBDCs get adopted as a tool to help balance out the negative uh, consequences and speed of you know, moving towards hyperinflation, for example? Would that be an attractive tool, like more attractive the more inflation rises? Uh, I, I don't want to speculate about about hyperinflation and uh, uh, mm -hmm. but but in terms of we are at a very special juncture because all interest rates are very low um, mm -hmm. and, and so uh, the, the the scope to move all any interest rates around um, is is relatively limited unless it's uh, unless it's up uh, for the policy rate and if you if, if for some reason there would there were to be a lot of inflation and the central bank wanted to do something about it 
the policy rate, i.e. the interest rate on reserves would go up. Uh, uh, however, the interest rate on CBDC would have to, everything else equal, go down relative to the policy rate. Okay, uh, so so I, I often encounter this so, misunderstanding. So CBDCs would become much more attractive with higher no, inflation. No, le uh, less attractive. If you wanted to make sure that there's less inflation, you would have to make holding money of all kinds less attractive, right? Because uh, you don't want so much money sloshing around the economy, chasing a given- But, but, but for policymakers, it would be a more attractive tool. So it, it would be seen as like a tool to mitigate inflation in a way that the policy rate and traditional central bank reserves could not, in which- It would be, it would be seen as, you know, and you know, this is, this, this is a research paper, uh, bear that in mind, no. right? But no. uh, if, you, if you take that research paper at, at face value, then you get a second tool, right? You have the policy rate and you can do with that whatever you would have done anyway, uh, but you have get a second it. tool. However, that second tool, uh, in order to make it disinflationary, in order to bring inflation down, you would have to reduce that rate, not increase it. Okay, right. and, and that and, in, a, in, a, in an environment where interest rates is, uh, are already very low, there's limited scope for that. And, and for all of this to work, the only thing that has to really stay, stay, <laughs> stay, stay solid, stay constant, is that it doesn't become like the endless cookie jar that the existing system has, right? So you can't just get it from any bank deposit. You can't, like you, you, you have certain limits around this that make it uniquely different. So as, as, as long as in a boom cycle, people don't remove those limits to juice up the boom even more, then this will work. But if they that remove those limits, then this just is, exacerbates the boom and the bust. So it's, it's kind of like, it's, if, you, if you use this right, you have, um, you know, sorry, maybe backup isn't the right term, but it's the best one I can come up. You have a kind of secondary system here that you can use to mitigate certain risks. But if you screw it up, it'll just supercharge the risks. You arrived at 30%. You said we should cap the amount of CBDC at 30% of our GDP. Is that wow. sort of, was that the magic number you found to say this no, is the way we no, can kind that of was just, the control? That was just to present a quantitative experiment and the 30% was guided by uh, the average quantity of QE, which had been done by central banks over the preceding years. QE, however, being a very different kind of central bank money issuance because that's mm -hmm. that's uh, central bank reserves rather than a retail form of money, right? Uh, but the magnitudes were roughly comparable and we needed to do some sort of meaningful quantitative experiment. And that's why it shows 30%. By no means does this mean that we say, oh, we should issue 30% and no more than that. Uh, that that's, a, that's an entirely, you know, decision that needs to be made from scratch. Uh, and uh, to get back to Sergey's point, um, uh, you know, you would have a second policy instrument and like with any other policy instrument, you can do it right and you can do it wrong. Um, and, and, and basically that's what you're, what you're saying amounts to. And yes, if you are doing it right, uh, you, can, uh, you can help to stabilize the economy. That would be our point. It's fascinating. Professor Kumov, thank you so much. I'm going to I'm going to print these out and I'm going to I'm going to, you know, I might contact you. Don't be surprised. Um, this is fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Super. Thanks, Sergey. Also for the questions. We actually have a, a many questions also from other participants. So I'd love to have time to, to get to them. Um, Clark, can I add a to that? Sure. Yes. I, may. I think a digital euro is a sine qua non without the without which the future of Europe would be at stake. It's probably a bold claim to state, but at the end, if I'm paying for a coffee in Berlin or in Madrid, it travels over an American credit card rail, more, more likely than not. That is disastrous. And I think if, if anything, what we've learned from our venture perspective is best product wins. And we're in the middle of new technology being rolled out also in the context of Payment Service Directive 2, enabling open banking and API access to banking rails. And again, it seems like that the American or foreign tech players are actually pretty good in availing themselves of these type of connectivity. And so I think the, the perspective that we still find hard to answer is in that context, the, the conversation around privacy and design. And this is also where it crosses into your world, Sergey, around decentralization and decentralization first. I think the trouble is, if you ask the European consumer, does privacy matter to you? 
as your public consultation has shown, the answer will always be yes. But behavior is different. Behavior is different. If you look at people's home screens on their phones, it's all um, American or consumer platforms that suck off information. So they say privacy is important, but behavior is different. So how can we design a, a nation state, a continent's financial system so it is the best product? So it is the best product layer on top of which other local players are happy and proud to innovate and to build really good product that the end consumers will want to use. And I think that's the only that's the only way to win. Maybe uh, Sergey, can I pull you in here just because this is a, a really key I I issue. Europeans, yeah. half of them said uh, privacy is important to me, and yet um, we've seen I think the in Sweden, what is it for? Or, or you know, people are using four percent cash, which means ninety six percent of the money they're spending is not private. You have an account attached to it. You're using your EC card or your credit card. Ultimately, that's not private. Somebody can trace it and figure it out. So it's a, it is a paradox that everybody says privacy is important to me, but I'm actually completely transparent, mainly in the way I'm spending my money already. You, of course, um, with bridging the world to distributed ledger technology and blockchain, many people say it's fabulous because it's so transparent. On the other hand, it can also be to some degree anonymized. How do you see technically trying to you know, square this circle of getting getting a system that could be some kind of a hybrid model. So privacy could be maintained um, and yet these worlds could be bridged. Yeah, so there's two kind of uh, tensions that I that I see here. The, the first tension is everyone is making their own infrastructure with their own rules. And sometimes the infrastructure that people make internally as payments companies or whatever have rules that benefit them. It's not so surprising since capitalism kind of encourages that, that type of uh, behavior. Um, what blockchains do and blockchain networks do is they create a standard set of rules and a standard infrastructure, right? So the problem before with making rules was that you would make rules, but you would not have a technology provider that could impartially enforce the rules. And then you would be faced with uh, something called the kingmaker problem. And they had this with the legal entity identifier scheme, right? So you, they, you need to designate an entity in each country that issues legal entity identifiers and they get an advantage, right? And the legal identity legal entity identifier is one of the few things to come out of the 2008 crisis. So you, you have this issue where you want to create standards that everyone follows, but you, you, you then create the standard and someone needs to implement it. But then when it gets implemented, people inject their personal uh, commercial interests into the implementation. What blockchains do is they allow you to define both a data standard and an infrastructure standard which means that now you, you've defined how everyone not only follows a certain standard, but also how they run the infrastructure and they can't deviate from either, right? So what you can do with blockchains is you can create a global um, or regional standard at the level of what's acceptable in terms of how data is uh, structured, transferred, secured, and you can mandate the infrastructure that people need to run. And therefore, you are not tied to any one technology company as a kingmaker, right? You are not tied to that technology company building the data standard or influencing it in their interest. And this is where the power of open source, I think, will now mesh with the global financial system in an extremely meaningful way. And there's a reason that the whole world run on, runs on Linux, which is open source, and the whole world runs on HTTPS, which is open source, because it's an impartial standard that everybody can get behind because there's a, um, an ongoing negotiation there about what benefits everybody. So that's what I think the, the first, that's the first tension. And that's where commercial enterprises are going to be inferior for creating a standard like this just by virtue of their conflict of interest. And then the second tension is the tension of privacy. And so the tension of privacy is how do you merge the privacy preserving properties of centralized systems and the transparency forcing properties of blockchain systems, right? So how do you get the transparency benefits of blockchains while maintaining the privacy that centralized systems both want and are, are you know, has been baked into legal systems, right? Legal systems have been built around centralized infrastructure. And so they, they've kind of come to require things, right? The, the answer there is that you actually need um, a robust system to integrate. So you need a way to integrate both across chains in a way that can preserve privacy and a way to integrate with existing systems that can preserve privacy. And this is uh, probably done through the use of zero knowledge proofs 
and eventually possibly through something called homomorphic encryption, which is you know uh, still kind of being developed. But there are technologies that allow you to prove things into this global standardized system of, of data standards and infrastructure standards running the data standards. But to retain the private details in the centralized way that complies with local regulations and, and, and actually gives people privacy. So I think that once you, everyone is now talking about scalability, right? And that's true. And the 40K transactions per second that was shown, there's actually another zero there. So it's 400,000 transactions per second is what I've seen possible with these technologies. Um, so the scalability problem is finally getting polished. The privacy problem is really more about how you encrypt data between centralized and public blockchain systems. And what is the technology that does that? And to a large degree, that's what we work on, right? So we work on how to integrate information across different blockchain systems to allow them to interoperate with each other. But also we work very heavily with, with leading enterprises on how do you get um, centralized existing enterprise systems to interface with blockchain systems while revealing the bare minimum of information, but revealing enough to prove things to the blockchain so that things like fraud, and uh, you know, various other risks are mitigated. So you, you wanna prove just enough to solve 99% of fraud problems, but you don't wanna prove the last 1% because that'll, um, that'll go beyond the legal framework. That'll go beyond what people are comfortable with. And if you have zero knowledge proofs and homomorphic encryption, you can actually keep data in private systems, but you can prove things about it to the public systems that are sufficient for the security and fraud resistance that they need. So, so that is really where, um, where things are going. And, and that's the next stage after scalability because without scalability, nobody's gonna wanna use any of this. So scalability is getting wrapped up this year, next year. Privacy is getting going this year, uh, next year. So my expectation over the next two to three years with the right systems um, to integrate and the right scalability of blockchains themselves and the, specter of inflation um, and, the spec and the benefits of CBDCs, I think all those three things, I think the features will get easier to use and the demand will, will grow. And there will be kind of an, an inflection point where people go, what other tools do I have? Oh shit, they're few and far between. Um, this thing's good enough now, it's baked, it's baked enough. Let's use it. That's um, my unsolicited uh, prediction. Sergey, thanks so much. That's uh, really helpful. It's also uh, it's great to hear that the tech is catching up with the need right now. Uh, it's also, of course, fascinating to hear that we're still at the very beginning. Um, uh, and as, as you said, uh, going, going beyond, going beyond, we've actually now gone beyond our time. So I'd love to briefly hand the mic off to, um, to our uh, two experts that joined us uh, for perhaps a final thought. And then I'd let Professor Fluger wrap things up. But first, um, Michael Kumhoff, uh, any reflections or thoughts to, uh, to end our session? Thanks so much for your insights. And uh, perhaps you've, you've heard something today that uh, gives you some, some new thinking about things going forward, perhaps the kernel of your next paper. Uh, no, thank you. I, I, I can keep it brief. I found what Sergey just said fascinating because that's the kind of insight you don't get from where I work from. And, and it, it's, it sounds very good. It sounds encouraging. Um, it, perhaps if I was closer to the team in the Bank of England that is doing sort of the same thing that the ECB is doing uh, with different emphases. Uh, I would know more about this, but it's, it's, it's fascinating to keep up with that. In terms of ongoing work, uh, we are right now in the middle of a paper that looks at the open economy and cross-border dimension of this and what it would mean for capital flows and uh, the interaction of monetary policies in two countries, for example. Uh, that's also, I, I think, in terms of what practitioners want to know on the economic theory front, that's, that's, that's top of the list. So we'll, we'll very soon have a paper ready for that. Um, I, I don't really have anything else to say. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to participate. Super. Well, we're really, really delighted to have had you here. And thanks so much for your insights. Uh, another big thanks to um, the four partners uh, in this study, uh, the IEF and Jennifer Boda. Thanks so much for all your help. Um, Iconomy, uh, amazing work, Valeria, incredible study. Thanks so much um, for your presentation today and, and for the work we've done together um, with, uh, with you and Felix and Simon Schwerin uh, on this project. Um, and uh, Nico, Lake Star, it's really thrilling to have you on board uh, and also fighting for the European sovereignty angle. Um, and I think it's a really important statement that, uh, that you said there. 
uh, and um, and also Sergey and Chainlink. Thanks so much uh, for the partnership on this uh, on this project and your amazing team, but also for for the insights you brought today. It's really uh, fun to have somebody who is uh, super deep into the technical stuff, uh, but knows how to bridge the world. So thanks thanks to uh, all four of your partners. And uh, wrap things up. Uh, let Professor Fluger have the mic, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Professor Fluger, Schlusswort, as we say. Auf well, Deutsch. Well, 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 thank you, thank you, Clark, but but no no wrap up. Uh, I would just like to say a thank you for for uh, joining us today, and well, all the best. It's a it's a big task in front. Of you. Thank you, all guys. The best. Have, have a great best. afternoon. Have a good and, uh, Fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.